Hey guys, welcome to Guy's Stuff number three. This one is all about rib basics and one of my favorite recipes. Now, first of all, I'm going to go through, this video is going to be a little long because I'm going to go through a lot of basics on doing ribs and some of the equipment that you really should have if you're going to do these with any kind of frequency. First of all, one really important thing is to have a cutting board. This is a little normal one and they're, they're basically plastic and they're flexible and they're great for doing veggies and stuff because you can chop them all up and then take them and put them in a pot or whatever. But they are really no good for doing large stuff like ribs. You can see the rack I have here. This is folded under when you, when you see it out of the package. You'll see it's much even longer than this. You just can't fit them on this plus you can't carry them around because they're kind of flimsy. So these no good for ribs. What you want to get is a large cutting board and really get the biggest one you can find. I got this one. This is actually the second one I've tried. You can see it's much bigger than the rack, so it's absolutely perfect for working with. I got this at Walmart for, I believe, 23 bucks, something right around there. Nice, solid plastic. Got a little groove for catching liquids. Really nice. You don't have to worry about it uh, really warping or anything. It's a little twisted now. I sent it through the dishwasher a couple times, but that's as far as it goes. Don't bother with the large wood ones. At this size, they're made up of multiple planks and they do warp. You get them wet, you send them, you know, not only that, but they're hard to get blood and such out of. They're really only good for vegetables. So don't bother with the wood, get the plastic, and you'll be all set there. It's a real time saver. You can use this to not only prep, but you can transport to and from your grill. So that's really important. Now, what you do to the meat is completely personal choice. There, You'll see that there are several distinct steps to really doing tender, moist, delicious ribs. And each step you have choices to make. And there are virtually endless combinations of how you can do your stuff. And I'm sure in the future I'm gonna be doing multiple rib videos because there are just so many different ways that you can do it and get very different results. The first thing you have to choose is what ribs you're going to cook. There are three main types, that is of pork ribs. There are, of course, beef ribs, but here in Tampa, beef ribs are insanely expensive. They're about three to four times as expensive as pork ribs, and they really don't taste that much different than a good porterhouse to me, so I don't really see the point in doing them. Now, pork ribs, of course, are my choice, and you have three main types of pork ribs. The first are called country style, and those are basically like really thick cut pork chops. They have very large bones and a very large slab of meat on top of the bones. They're not arranged in a rack like this. They're typically cut up into single size bone and meat servings, and they're very thick. They don't have a lot of surface fat, but they have a lot of fat marbling throughout. So you absolutely must cook them low and slow to get any kind of decent flavor out of them. And the meat itself, it's not as juicy and tender as what you think of in a restaurant or what you see here in a normal rack. And like I said, all the bones are large. I prefer smaller size than country ribs myself. So I don't recommend country style really for anything. Next down the line in the pig, you have this section called spare ribs, also called short ribs. And this is kind of a combination. You have the one side going from medium sized bones down here. You can see the size of them, so roughly finger and a half wide or so. They go down to the smaller size bones. And these guys down here, they're, they're the size of my pinky finger. They're short and they're thin. So you get a good range of bone size all the meat is very tender, very little marbling in the meat itself. You have some surface fat here, but that's it. You have a very good variety of sections, <clears throat> and I'll show you in a bit, we have a variety of ways that we can actually prepare this actual type of slab. Next down the line, going further down the pig, you have the last section, which are called back ribs or baby back ribs. And they are simply all small ribs. They're more of what you think of in a restaurant. All the meat is nice and tender, of course. It's kind of like this section down. Just all these small ones. 
in a full rack size. The meat tastes the same between the spare ribs and the baby back ribs. The biggest difference is they've done all the prep for you when you get baby backs. They are just pretty much ready to dress and get cooking. You don't have to trim fat. They don't have surface fat like this. They don't have any meat that you need to trim off. They're already squared, just ribs, so they're ready to go. I prefer to save about a buck a pound, get these spare ribs, you get more actual meat, and I don't mind doing the prep work. Okay, now we do have several choices of what we could actually do with these spare ribs or short ribs. But first, another very important tool, an extremely sharp knife. Dull knives are the most dangerous tool in the kitchen and that is not an exaggeration. So if you don't have a sharp knife set, get one or at least get a sharpener and sharpen yours up. They need to be very, very sharp to easily go through cartilage and in some cases little bones. But we don't have a lot of trimming that we absolutely need to do to this. At the bare minimum, what we need to do is take off all the loose surface fat. And that's done very easily. You just lift it up. They're usually in little nodules. You don't want to go into the meat. You just want to get these little fat nodules off. There's plenty of fat in there that's already layered that will render while cooking and give us lots of flavor and juices. So this stuff is just extra. That is no good. There's also this little ridge of meat, like a little fold, runs diagonally through here. And some cuts from the butcher will be more prominent than others. This one is very small. This is only about a quarter inch tall. And I actually don't really need to do anything to it, but I do want to take off the fat that's along it. In other cases, this may be as tall as an inch and a half or so. And what you want to do is just cut it flat. This one's so short it's a little hard to grab, but this is all you do right here. You just want to trim it flush with the rest of the ribs. I'm going to continue taking some little bits of fat off here. This doesn't make a huge, huge difference in some cases, but it does in others. And I'll talk about that later. It really depends on how you're cooking these and if the fat's going to play a big role later on. Got some big chunks on the side here. Now this is a bone. This is really the biggest difference between short ribs and baby back ribs. You can trim short ribs or spare ribs up in what's called St. Louis style and that gives you what you think of as ribs in a restaurant. A squared off all rib and meat type of cuts and that's very easy to do but I actually in most cases when I'm cooking them prefer not to do that because it does waste a lot of meat this section right here is solid meat there's no bone in it it's really really good tender meat and if you were to trim this off it's simply wasted and that really takes your price per pound right up to baby back so if you're gonna do that I actually suggest getting baby back ribs but, as you'll see in most cases, I cook spare ribs without trimming them St. Louis style. It's a lot more bang for your buck. Really good meat. I mean, this is like a third of the actual meat on this cut. Why would I want to throw that away? But if you do want to do St. Louis style, and I'm going to do a little bit of trimming here because if you look at this end here, this is just a really, really thin meat. It's good meat, but it's thin meat. And it will cook unevenly as opposed to the much thicker ends in here. So just to prevent this from burning, you're not going to eat it anyway. I do trim this little end section off. And you can throw this on if you want, you know, a snack a couple hours into it or whatnot. By the way, this is a very long technique. You're in it for anywhere from three to six hours, depending on the choices you make. And this is how you get extremely tender, juicy, fall off the bone, literally fall off the bone ribs. And this is how I like to do them. We're just going to trim a little bit more here. Alright, this side's looking pretty good. You don't have to worry about the fat that's really stuck down. Just the pieces that are sticking up. Just the real extras. Now this bone here, this is the only really big strip of bone other than the ribs themselves. And there's no meat to be had really right around it. Not a big deal if you want to trim this off. There's a lot of cartilage. You have the bones 
and then they end right here, and then you have a little bit of cartilage right in here. If you have a sharp knife, you can put it right in the seam and cut them off. Problem is, if you cut out this bone without doing it St. Louis style, you end up with this flap unsupported. So it can flip and flop a lot back. You know, it depends on how you're putting it on the, the grill. So I leave it on. It's not a big deal at all to trim up after they're cooked. It's actually a lot easier than what I'm doing here. To actually cut them up, get them, <clears throat> excuse me, get them ready to serve and all that. So all I do before usually is trim the fat. Alright, this way looks good. Let's flip it over, take a look over here. In the corner over that big bone, you're going to have a flap of meat and a big layer of fat underneath it. I leave this on. This fat is going to, for the most part, render, and this just basically peels off at the end of cooking. And then you just simply, you can, if it's still warm, you can peel off this entire solid section of fat, and there's meat underneath that. So that's not a big deal. I don't trim this off. Some people do, and that's fine. But the fat under here is going to it's going to cook. I do trim this bit off. I want to snag the bone. Pretty hard to work with sometimes because it's so floppy. You know? And like I said, a sharp knife makes all the difference when working with this kind of stuff. It doesn't take much pressure at all. Alright. So that pretty much does it with the basic prep. Got all the loose fat off that I want to take off. Meat looks good. Now the next choice you have is what are you going to do as far as sauce? or a rub. Those are the basic two choices. And this is really personal preference. The one thing in common is that you do want to put a basic of some salt down. The salt is really going to help tenderize the meat. You want to use a coarse salt. I get coarse sea salt. You can get it from just about any major grocery store. The difference between it and fine salt or table salt just the physical size. You can see the salt crystals are many times larger than a typical table salt. Here is that. Table salt or fine granulated salt is made for consumption. It's great in sauces, it's made for cooking, it dissolves. The coarse stuff doesn't. It'll stick to this meat, it'll tenderize it, and it'll stay there all the while that it's cooking. So if you do use any kind of prepared rub, and it has salt in it, such as this one here. This is a really good one uh, if I'm grilling, not barbecuing or smoking, but grilling. This is an excellent one I use sometimes on steaks. And you can look at it and see the size of everything that's in it. Very small, very granulated. This is just for grilling, fast cooking or finishing rub or you know dressing. So these are no good. You have uh, this one here. This is another popular one. Uh, it's actually good on steaks and burgers, and it's really not bad on pork. I don't use it too much. Uh, it does have some other things in it that I, I don't really care for. Um, it's got some paprika in it and uh, uh, sunflower oil, and it looks like some cumin and it's a really good flavor on steak I love it on beef I'm not a huge fan of it on pork but it does have nice decent sized salt crystals still not as big as dedicated coarse salt though so this is all I recommend for your actual tenderizing salt there are many dedicated pork rubs uh, this is just a generic one this is from uh, McCormick Grill Mates and they make a very good line of stuff they also have another one that is uh, apple butter flavor, and that's really good. I, I prefer the apple one on ribs. But this just gives a slightly sweet, smoky flavor. And you use this in addition to your salt and pepper, and it can give it a nice 
little kick in flavor. It's not real potent, so you have to use it liberally. About a half a can per rack. And they're only about four or five bucks. So sometimes I, I use this or the apple or some other stuff, and I'll go through different favorite recipes in the future, I'm sure. But for the most part, all I tend to use direct as my base rub is coarse salt and fresh ground peppercorns. Fresh ground peppercorns ground very coarsely makes a huge difference. It really gives it a nice snap and a bite. The oils come out very well with peppercorns. Definitely my favorite combination. Now, you do have the other option of going with a sauce instead of a rub. You don't have to do a dry rub on your ribs. You can do your favorite barbecue sauce. You can make a vinegar based if you want to wet mop it while it's cooking. That's all cool too. You know, it's all personal preference, what part of the country you're used to. It just gives a different flavor and uh, you know, different cooking techniques, but I like them all and I switch it up. I very rarely do the same thing more than once every couple months. So I'm just going to you know, hit this one. This is the most basic recipe. From here you can take it at the end and really do the most with it. You can use the meat and other things and I actually might use some of this particular rack in a soup I'm going to do. But you can then put your favorite sauce on it, you can dip it, you can put the sauce on the side, you can mop it at the end. Using a basic rub like this gives you the most options. But the last thing we need to do to short ribs to prep them is take care of this membrane here. Right on the back side where you can see the actual bones, there's what's like a plastic membrane. And number one, it's no good to eat. Number two, it doesn't let juices and smoke through. So we got to get rid of it. At the very least, you need to score the heck out of it with a knife. Make a nice crosshatch, you know, get some holes poked in through it. But there's really no reason to do that because if you use the secret weapon, a butter knife and paper towel, it comes right off. And all we have to do here, flip it around. All you have to do, go out to the second rib here, stick your butter knife in, under the membrane, just slide it in, wiggle it a little bit and the membrane comes right off the bone. Just work it up, work the knife under the membrane, don't tear it. Okay, you get yourself a nice hole that you can hold on to. You just take a paper towel and use it to grab the membrane. It's like Velcro. Now tear it all off in one nice solid piece, flip the paper towel a bit, get a better grip. Voila! No more membrane, ready to cook. Let's toss that. Alright, so now, now we're good to put our rub on. I gotta wash my hands again here so I can grab my bottles. Uh, it is helpful to, if you're doing a complex rub, do it in a bowl first so you can just sprinkle it and then you're not handling things back and forth. I'm going to wash my hands again and we'll put the rub on. Alright, with the salt, you want to be generous. A lot of this is going to fall off, render off, pour off with the fat as it's cooking. So you don't really have to worry about that. Obviously, if you're on a low salt diet, this isn't something that's really going to work for you because you do get a lot of salt when you're eating it, but it's really not that bad. I'm going to give a nice even coating on all the meat sections, not really important on the bone. There's a little meat there, but not much. This underside, this is the side that's going to be face down while cooking, so you just want to coat the meat, it's not that important. Same with the pepper. Uh, see, this is why I need the bowl. I'm kind of out of my routine shooting the video. Because <laughs> i got to flip it and then i got to wash my hands again. Uh, yeah, that's the easiest way. After you put the stuff on, give it a quick tap. Help it set into meat so it doesn't all fall off. 
salt will start working itself in. Help keep it moist while it's cooking. Help the fat render. And of course, bring out the flavor. Kind of like the nicotine strength in cigars. It's seasoning. Helps bring out what is there. All right. So now we're ready to do the important side. This is where most of your rub or most of your sauce is going to go. This is always going to be face up during the cooking process unless you're using rack and I'll show that in a future video. So then uh, that's a way to do a lot of meat in a small space. All right, wash my hands once more. on now let's talk about how to actually start cooking them all right just like there are multiple ways to prep the ribs there are multiple ways to cook the ribs basically four types the best way you can do it is on a dedicated smoker I don't have or use one of those so I use the second best way which is a charcoal pedal grill these are excellent because they give you a variety of types of cooking you can grill Grilling, in my opinion, is lit off, high heat, direct food over the coals, great for burgers, dogs, that kind of stuff, brats. But what I usually do is what I call barbecuing, and that's lid on, low heat, slow cooking, oftentimes indirect heat. Now what's cool about these Webers, is tons of accessories that you can get for them. The very basic one I recommend everybody gets is this smoking grate. But it gives you these two flaps. The grate that comes with it out of the box, just a solid grate. And that's great for grilling. Put your food on, you grill, you're done. You know, put the lid on, close the vents, coals go out, you're done. But if you're smoking or doing things, any anything you need to tend to the coals or add wood to or whatever, you're screwed because you can't get underneath the grate to get into your coal bin. But with this grate here, it gives you these flaps, both sides. You can drop in more coals or drop in smoking wood or whatever. Excellent accessory, absolutely essential in my opinion to any Weber kettle. Very inexpensive, about 15 bucks. The other thing that's absolutely critical to have if you're doing charcoal is what's called a chimney. A lot of people don't know the right way to start a charcoal fire going. These are the bomb dinghy. This is a Weber brand. I recommend this particular brand of model because it's the most sturdy. There are cheaper ones out there that just have a single rivet on the handle, but this one actually gives you a poor handle, so you can use it two-handed. This is very critical, not only for actually using it, but taking stress off these handle points. You just get the basic ones. Without this, without the shield, they're thinner metal. These points wear out, and you're going to buy a new chimney if you use it a lot every year had this one now for three years and it is good as day one. They're only about 20 bucks, you can get them every, everywhere. Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, whatever, nothing special there. So anyway, the way to get really juicy, tender, fall off the bone ribs is low and slow. This is the last piece I recommend. A little grilling thermometer. It's a bit dirty, it gets smoked up every time you use it. But basically, it's just a surface thermometer. This whole surface reads the temp and it's made specifically for grills. You set it right on the grill, 
next to your meat and gives you the actual temperature at your meat surface. Far better than a dedicated oven thermometer that might clip on or anything with a probe that's made to go in something. Those are not accurate when you're doing barbecue. Get the surface one made just for grilling. Let's see, this brand, this is very inexpensive. I got it off Amazon. This is a Kingsford brand, so it's specifically for barbecuing. And I think it was silly inexpensive. It was like seven bucks. So Google it, search Amazon for it. That's where I got this one. Very cheap. Look for the Kingsford barbecue thermometer. Absolutely critical for dialing in your grill. Once you figure out the combination of vents and what you have going, how much cold and all that, once you figure it out, you don't need this every time, but if you're doing something new, it's very important to really dial your thing in. Wow, those birds are going crazy. Hey, I'm filming here. Ah, whatever. So anyway, the important thing about this is you have to know where your temp is because it's very important for doing ribs. We're going to be doing these this time in three stages, two of them on the grill. The first stage, we're going to have the ribs out here at about 225 degrees, and they're going to cook basically uninterrupted for three hours. Okay, seriously, birds. Samus. Scram. I think they're pissed at me. I wonder if there's a nest around here. Eh. Oh well. Anyway, the second step we're going to do, and this is optional, I'm going to take it a step further and we're going to, this is what's going to make them fall off the bone. We're going to do a two hour cook in foil with some juice. And that's really what's going to step it up. And I'll go through that as we go along. So the first thing we need to do is start our charcoal. Do that very simply. We're putting in a full chimney. And all we have to do is wad up some newspaper, takes about three pages worth. And we're going to stick it underneath, actually get it going. Now you don't want to overstuff it, you need some room in there for air. Basically stuff enough newspaper in there just so it stays in, you know, no big deal. And then just light it evenly. And in about 20 minutes, this charcoal will be fully ready to pour onto the grill. I like to hold it up just a little bit to get the paper going. Then you just set it down. Now, obviously, I'm on a cement patio. You can't do this on a deck or anything flammable. If you don't have a dedicated spot like this that you can get dirty with ash or whatnot, you can technically do this part on your grill. The downside is you get a lot of paper ash, and sometimes that can get up on your food. So if at all possible, do it on concrete. If all you have is a lawn or something, just get one of those square concrete stepping stones, and it'll take care of it. All right, let's come back in 20 minutes, and we should be ready to start cooking. All right, we've got our coals ready here. Now, the way you can tell they're done is when they've started to turn gray and the flames start dying down, you know they're fully heated. They reach their hottest part when you don't see any black and you don't see any flames. These are like 95% lit, so I'm going to go ahead and pour them on. You want to do them all to one side of the grill. Pour them all up the side all along one side there and get the stragglers we're going to be cooking these ribs indirect They're really hot so be careful Whew. doesn't matter if you have a you know a couple string in there but get as many as you can packed up against the side this is going to provide us with real nice indirect heat and a base for our smoking wood now we can put on our grate Make sure you have one of those flaps right over your coals. Because now, we have an easy way of adding wood for smoking. Now you can use big chunks, like this here, this is some hickory I've got. Or you can use a smaller chips. If you use a smaller chips, just soak them in a big bowl for about a half an hour. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, that'll keep them 
from bursting into flames. These big chunks don't need it. These are going to go directly on our coals, and these are what is going to provide the nice smoke flavor added to the ribs. This is a completely optional step. It doesn't really make a huge difference, but it does give you a nice pink smoke ring, depending on the wood, you know, a little bit of flavor. I prefer the hickory myself, the mesquite. It can be a little too uh, sweet, for lack of a better word. It's kind of a weird flavor I get out of that. But anyway, now we're ready to actually put the meat on the grill. With these Webers, if you're doing one rack, totally easy. It's going to go flat with the, uh, the membrane side down, and it's just going to sit there. I'll show you in another video how I do up to three racks on this at a time. Kind of tricky, but you can do it. So now we're going to go ahead and add our meat. Got the rack out here on the cutting board. And when you're done with this, watch out for all the juices that are coming off. This has already started to break down from the salt. Lots of juices on the board. We're just going to put the meat directly on the grill. <clears throat> you want the bone side facing the charcoal. You can see that this night, this is the medium size Weber. It's the most typical size sold. There is a smaller one. I don't recommend the smaller one at all. Number one, you can't get as many accessories for it. Ow, I'm standing in hot coals. And they're really, really small. Now they do offer a huge one, and oh my god, I would love one of those. They're like a grand. It's absolutely ridiculous. So this is my favorite size for now. You can get this basic model. I don't know if they still sell this. This is the basic one without the catch can. Oh, my little pan fell down here. And uh, I'll fix that later. Anyway, this model, I got this for like 80 bucks. Certainly under 100. Now all I see is what's called the one-touch model. Basically, it's the same thing, same size but it has a, a, a captured ash can on the bottom, which I guess is good. I mean, if you're in an apartment or something, that's really handy. You know, I just dumped mine onto the lawn here, but I know this isn't the typical setup that you might have for your grill. And those typically run about 130, 140. Still a decent price, but you know, uh, I don't really want to pay 40 bucks for an ash can myself. So I'm, I'm happy with this basic model. And these last forever if you take care of them. About the only thing that kills them is rust. Uh, I'm on a little covered patio here, and I make sure I pull it back, you know, out of the way when I'm not cooking so it doesn't get rained on. You know, this thing is, uh, pff, I don't know, uh, 11 years old. <laughs> it looks basically as a little broken plastic on the wheel, but that's about it. So anyway, we've got our meat on here. Now, this is the first stage, or first step in a three-step process that I'm going to do in this video. The middle step is optional, and I'll talk about that when we get to it. But for now, we're done. The coals are hot. Now I know, because I've used my thermometer before, exactly how I want to set my vents. You want to put the lid on, vents over the meat. You want the bottom vents in this particular unit doing this. You want the bottom vents fully open. And the top one's about one third open. I'm going to close these two thirds. And that gets me right to between two and a quarter and 250 with a full chimney of hot coals. That's exactly where you need to be to get really, oh, I forgot the wood, to get really tender, juicy ribs. And trust me, I have done this more times than I can count. I have a lot of these recipes that I like, and I know how to do it the way I like it. So to add the wood, we'll simply put it right on top of the coals. It is not going to burst into flames because we're going to be cooking with the lid on. This is simply going to smoke without igniting. Now, this whole recipe that I'm doing is very easy because it only requires one chimney of coal. You don't have to tend it, you don't have to add any more. You can do it longer and lower, like you would in a typical smoker. However, if you do deviate from this, you may need to add more coals, and that makes things a lot more inconvenient. You can't just add new coals to the fire. You have to start them up in the chimney, get them hot. You get temperature fluctuations as the coals burn down. It's going to drop down to 175, 150 maybe, and then you put the hot coals in, jumps back up to 300, stabilizes again. That's really not ideal. This combination that I'm going to show you, running it at two and a quarter to 250, no lower than that because if you get lower than that, the fat doesn't render <clears throat> and the connective tissues don't break down as well. So 
you'll get good ribs, but not fall off the bone ribs. <clears throat> and if you go over 250, the meat cooks fine, but it starts to burn compared to the fat. And it, again, doesn't have time to really break down the connective tissues. So again, it's good, more like a restaurant rib, but it's not fall off the bone good. So this combo that I'm showing you today, this is how to get the absolute most tender, moist fall off the bone ribs. This is what I like to do. So now we got it on there, you can see some smoke coming out. That's gonna die down a bit. Uh, the coals will start to cool down as the smoke fills and you know, the oxygen's limited a bit. So it, it's a little hot right now, it's gonna come down, it'll stabilize between two and a quarter and 250 in just a few minutes. And now we simply let this set for about an hour. We're gonna check on it a couple times, but this stage is gonna take a total of three hours. It's gonna sit there on that side. We don't flip it, we don't move it, and we'll do anything to the coals for three hours. The only thing we're gonna do is check on it a couple times to make sure the, the meat is nice and moist. And you can do a couple things. If you've tenderized it with salt and pepper like this, you may not have to do a thing. It may be completely juicy. The fat's gonna sit there and render. It's just gonna be dripping juices, that's fine. If you use a different kind of rub, and it's not doing that. You may need to mop it, maybe with a vinegar sauce or a little bit of barbecue sauce. Completely up to you, but this is how I'm gonna do it here. So, we're gonna come back in an hour, and again at two hours for just a couple checks, and then we'll go to the next step at the end of three hours. All right, we're one hour in. You can see the smoke has died down considerably. That's actually what you want for smoking meat. You don't wanna see a ton of smoke all the time. You want it subtle. And here we can see that coals are still nice and hot. Like I said, I know my grill, and this is right at about two and a quarter right now. Now an hour in, we're not going to see a lot happening with meat. Just a little bit of a browning. That's mainly from the smoke coating. You can see the salt and pepper starting to really work on the meat there. Starting to look and firm up a bit. You can see the individual ribs getting a little more pronounced and the edge is starting to look cooked. Now it's still obviously very raw at this point, but in another hour or two we're going to see some stuff happening. Now it's nice and juicy. I can see that I've got nice moist meat still, so no need to mop it. Probably going to put a little bit of barbecue sauce on at the next check. And after that what we're going to be looking for are some specific things like the meat pulling back from the ribs, and that's how you know it's done. So, lid back on, let this continue, we'll come back in another hour. We're two hours in, and I'm going to go check the ribs in a second. I, I typically put a little bit of sauce, or at least something moist, on them at this point, just to get them through the last hour. Now, a little word on barbecue sauces. It's all to taste. They all... Do the same thing for the meat itself. These are some of my favorites. Um, you can get these really huge gallon jugs, these half gallon size stuff at Sam's Club and Costco, dirt cheap. Uh, for example, this is a, a little retail bottle. I got this at probably Walmart or Sweet Bay. And they're like four bucks. I love Frank's Red Hot. It's awesome on its own. It's great to mix stuff. I'll do a uh, buffalo chicken wing video at some point and I use that in, as part of the sauce but for example I get a gallon of Frank's Red Hot at Sam's Club mind you this little bottle and you probably get about oh a good 15 or 20 of these in the big bottle for 10 bucks so it's just insane to buy these little tiny ones at retail and not get the big bulk ones again this Cattleman's one I haven't actually tried this one yet I just bought it I love to try new stuff and uh, this was $8.99, you know, for this huge jug. Likewise with this uh, Sweet Baby Ray's, this was only 6 bucks. This is one of my favorites. It's a very sweet barbecue sauce. And if you want to kick it up, you can either add a little Franks in it or just some straight regular Tabasco sauce to give it a little bit of a bite. But if you're cooking for people that don't like spices, I love hot stuff. I mean, it can't be hot enough for me. But my wife doesn't like hot stuff. My parents don't like hot stuff. So when I cook for people, I typically go the safe route and just go for a nice sweet barbecue sauce. But anyway, let's go check the ribs. And I'm gonna try this one today. It's not gonna add much to the recipe because I'm just using this to moisten it. And then I put my sauce uh, for this particular one I'm doing today on the side. So they're not gonna be really, you know, bathed or uh, 
really cooking in the sauce. So it's not going to add that much, but I want to see what it tastes like and we'll try it out. So let's see what the ribs are looking like after two hours. Not too different. We're seeing a little bit of meat pulling back off the bones. That's what we want to see happening. Salt's just sitting there doing its thing. And the meat's not crispy, but it's definitely drying out. So now we're going to add some moisture. And this is, again, completely to taste. You can do any kind of barbecue sauce. You can do, you know, a vinegar mop, whatever you like. I've got this Kalman sauce here. I did try it. I actually really like it. Just a little sweetness, and it's got a nice vinegar tang to it. Don't need to do anything special. Just coat all the top of the meat. Yeah. Just spread it around. Everything stays relatively moist. And you can see the juices flowing out as we do this. And this is just to stop anything from drying up and getting too burnt. I'm going to keep it on the meat. Don't need to spill it. This will just sit here and do its thing for the next hour. Gives a nice little subtle taste to the finished product, but as you'll see, it doesn't play a huge part in the flavor. The biggest part of the flavor of this is the charcoal and the smoke. Got plenty of wood left there. All right, back on for the final hour, and then we're going to do. An important but optional step. See you in an hour. All right, we are three hours in. Let's take a look, see what we've got. <clears throat> oh yeah, that looks good. Got a nice pullback of the meat from the bones. You can see them sticking out now. Nice crust forming on the sauce. Still very juicy. You can see the juice oozing out out of the meat still. All right, that's real good. Still have plenty of heat coming off the coals, just enough for the next step. Now, at this point, what you have are restaurant ribs. These are going to be very tender. You can slice them up and, you know, pick them up, eat them like normal ribs off the bone. It's going to be very juicy, very delicious. Do what you want with your sauces. However, if you want extremely tender, fall off the bone like literally and I'll show you that this is the next step you're gonna do I brought my cutting board out and take these off and bring them inside and I'll show you what we do next here you can see the rack looks absolutely delicious tempting not to eat these right now but I know they get better so I'm gonna wait here's what we're gonna do we're gonna basically steam them for another two hours we're gonna put them in aluminum foil and here's a really good tip too. If you belong to Sam's Club or Costco or any kind of place that has commercial supplies, you can use regular size aluminum foil, but it doesn't cover much. What we want to do is absolutely seal these up. So you can see it's not long enough to go lengthwise. And if we make a sheet like this, it doesn't fold over the sides well enough and you got to put another sheet on top and it just gets kind of rickety. What you do, you get the commercial size. Makes life so much easier when you're doing a lot of barbecuing and cooking. You can see that these longer than the ribs and we can just fold them up real nice and easy. I'll probably actually do it this way and then just tuck it in. Then the secret is we put in some fluid, some liquid to actually create steam. Now you're not really powering the flavors here. What you're doing is just adding something subtle because the steam doesn't add much to the flavors at this point. What it's doing more is just tenderizing the meat. What you want to use is something very potent. Now, I like using apple juice because it adds a nice, sweet, tangy flavor to the meat, especially if you're doing an apple rub like I talked about in the beginning. If you use apple juice, it's important that you get one that's not only 100% juice, but one that's not from concentrate. It adds a lot more flavor than the frozen concentrate varieties. 
You can find this in pretty much every grocery store. They'll have at least one brand that is not from Concentrate. And if you can't find it, uh, try the baby section because it's a uh, very popular look around the baby food. But this is a Walmart brand, great value. You can find it just about anywhere. Incidentally, this is the only brand of Not From Concentrate that Walmart offers their own. So not a big deal to uh, find, but it does make a difference. You know, if you can't find it, um, not a huge deal. Like I said, it's not making a big difference to the meat, but it does make a, a difference that you can taste. So it's not any more expensive. Try other juices too, or you can just use uh, a real thin barbecue sauce. But you need to be careful. You only want to use about a half cup per rack. You don't want the ribs sitting in the juice. You don't want them to be poached or anything like that. And you need uh, a little enough liquid that it's actually going to start boiling and steaming. Ideally, at the end of two hours, you're going to open this up and barely have any liquid left in there. If you open it up and there's, uh, if you use too much liquid, the fat, as it's rendering out, doesn't have any place to go and you get this really nasty sludge the meat's just sitting in. Well, that's no good. So use about a half cup max and you'll be all set. And it just has to be a real thin liquid. You can't use a real thick barbecue sauce or anything like that. That won't steam. So I'm going to go ahead and get the tin foil going or aluminum foil. Make our little wrap here and put in the apple juice. Here I've got the little boat made. Put in about half a cup of the juice. You just pour it right on top. It'll just filter down to the bottom. That's all it takes. I've got another sheet here. Be careful when you fold this over. It's really easy to poke a hole through with the bones that are sticking out. So just gently fold it in. You just want to seal it. And again, with this huge commercial sheets, really easy to do. Put another sheet on. Fold it over. I'll tuck those under. And then this whole thing is going right back on the grill, right where it was. And that's just going to sit for two hours. We won't need to do anything with it. And then we'll go into the last step. All right, we are five hours total into our cooking time. Take a look at what we've got. Oh, man, does it smell good. This is my favorite part. Oh, I can smell the rib meat. I can smell the sauce. Sweetness of the apple juice. Looking good. Coal still have heat. Perfect timing. Now to get this off, what you want to do is use a nice, sturdy, big of a spatula as you can find. You want to be very careful when you're sliding it underneath. I just kind of pick up one hand with uh, my hand. You know, it's not that hot. Get the spatula under there and then quickly transfer it onto the cutting board. Bring it inside. That's what I'm going to do right now. Now here's a really easy part. You just let it sit. Let it sit, totally wrapped up, still sealed, for 20 to 30 minutes, and all those juices are going to reconstitute. It's going to heat it evenly. It's just going to get more tender. It's going to sit in there and just stew. It's going to be absolutely awesome. So after the 20, 30 minutes, I'm going to take the foil off, and they are going to be ready to do however you want to do them. If you want to put some sauce on them, if you want the sauce on the side, you know, you want to chop it up, whatever you want to do. So we'll take a look in another 20 minutes. All right, setting time has passed. Now it's ready to eat. Scoot this forward a bit here. Pick off the foil. Oh man, the whole house smells like sweet ribs. Inside we have Beautiful, super tender rib meat. Perfect. Just a little bit of rendered fat and juice left. That's absolutely what I wanted. Just falls apart. It's like butter. Stringy pulled pork. I gotta try it. Mmm. Yeah, that sauce was a good idea. I'm going to buy some more of that. But anyway. Beautiful cuts. 
See the bones just fall out. Can't even pick it up. Try to pick this thing up and well you just get all the bones out. What a problem to have. <laughs> so now you're left with just this delicious beautiful rib meat. Got a nice pink smoke ring in there. Nice crust, absolutely butter soft. Just tears apart. And there you go. That is one of my favorite ways. I will certainly make some more rib videos because there are, like I said, endless combinations of what you can do with different steps, different things you can use, different ways to prep it, different ways to use it. You know, you can eat these with your fingers, you can chop them up, you can make it into a stew, whatever you want. I mean, it's just a great, easy way to make some beautiful meat. Oh, they're so good. Mm. Oh yeah, I mentioned there's four ways to do it. Mm. It's gonna be tough not eating this before the wife gets home for dinner. <laughs> First best way is smoker, which I don't have. Second best way is like I showed you on the Weber or any really good charcoal grill. Third way is a, a gas grill. I had to do a couple racks last week for Thanksgiving. I was up visiting relatives. And I threw two racks on, put on the center burner, threw these on the sides. You know, it worked okay. Absolutely as tender, you're just missing some flavor. You know, obviously you don't have the smoke, you don't have the charcoal, and that really does add a lot, in my opinion, to the enjoyment of the ribs. But, you know, it's not actually necessary. You can add sauce and you can do other things to make it just as good. Oh, look at that. See, this is why I prefer to really leave the short ribs or the spare ribs intact and not chop them up St. Louis style. All of this, I mean, this is just solid meat. That would have been thrown out if I would have trimmed them up. You can see here, here's the bone. That's gone. <laughs> no big deal whatsoever. And you still have these big ribs here that you can just slice into pieces if you want. Or, you know, eat it any way you want to. Of course, the fourth way is the oven. You do it just the same way. You're just uh, basically baking it on low. Now, if you do a gas grill or the oven, you're going to have to adjust your temperatures and probably your time. Keep an eye on it. Uh, you might have to adjust the temperature up a bit. You know, two and a quarter is great for charcoal grill. <clears throat> excuse me, charcoal grill, because you're getting indirect heat, you're getting infrared heat, you're getting convection heat in the kettle. You don't get all that with a gas grill or an oven. So, play around with it. Anyway, thanks for watching Guy Stuff number three. I'll be back shortly with some more stuff. Oh, I gotta eat this. See ya. Mmm.